Yeah, thanks for everyone for coming today. It's uh, great to see such a full room because uh, today we're going to see something uh, that has never been seen in the history of Cayman ever, and that is the measurement of uh, rock movement from within the fragmented zone. So, of course, I'm leaving that right to the end. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to thank our development partners, Rio Tinto, Newcrest, and CRC Mining. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Andre Van Ass and Sandy Talo. Uh, without their involvement, this project would, would not exist. So, thank you, GIS. Okay, just a bit of an overview. We'll just talk a bit about what the K tracker system actually does, cover a brief history, and then we'll get into some of the results. So what is the cave tracker system? The cave tracker system comprises of several components. One of the most important is represented by these red dots, uh, which we call beacons. And you, and you embed these within the mine uh, before you start mining. And the beacons are designed to travel down through the mine as the cave propagates up and the rock moves down to the draw points. And we can track the 3D positions of these beacons on a daily basis, so essentially in real time in terms of uh, these sort of operations, and measure their 3D positions as they uh, head down to the draw points and eventually report to the draw points. Uh, they work by incorporating a strong magnet, we generate a very strong magnetic field, and uh, this magnetic field is picked up by detectors that we place in and around the mine. Uh, you can put the detectors in the extraction level, you can embed the detectors into, into long holes. So that's, that's the crux of it. And the detectors measure the range to the beacons, and we use the results from several detectors to triangulate, if you like, or a multilateration, but you can just imagine you draw out the vectors and you can uh, plot the three position of the beacons. Now just a, a very brief history, a lot of people have been involved in measuring cave flow over the years, lots and lots of people. So uh, the studies have become bigger and bigger, and originally sand models were used, sand was in glass, where sand was released from spigots at the bottom, and you could measure deformation in the structures. The models progressively got larger, and then larger still, actually, embedding flow markers, steel flow markers, into complete mines. Perhaps the biggest study in history was done where uh, 25,000 or more markers were put into Ridgeway Mine, and some of the gentlemen involved in that are, are sitting here right now. As you can imagine, putting such a large number of steel flow markers into a mine and recovering them by hand from the tramp magnets is a lot of labour, and analysing all those data points uh, involves a lot of labour. So at Alexon, we became involved to help automate this process and develop a smart marker system, uh, which works by the markers report to the draw point, picked up by an LHD loader, and then automatically detected by readers in the drives or the tipple. It gives us quite accurate time stamping of when the devices arrive, and by putting lots of markers in the mine, of course, you can infer, or, um, you can infer the flow paths of the moving rock. But the key part the key limitation of this method, though, even though it tells you so much interesting information, is you have to wait until the markers report to the draw point. So there may have been events occurring 200 days ago, uh, but you won't know about them until you start recovering the markers and statistically evaluating, but you still learn a tremendous amount of information. In addition to physically measuring flow markers, a tremendous amount of work is also going on, as you've seen today, in simulating, and the models are getting increasingly sophisticated. But why is all this work being done? The work has been done because we want to know how the auras move. It affects so many aspects of the mind, and we'll come, we'll come into that later for some of the motivations. But there's still a key part of the puzzle missing, and that key part is what is actually going on in this zone? What is going on at the boundaries? We just don't know. <laughs> it hasn't been able to be measured before. We can put TDRs in to, to measure some of these boundary characteristics. Now we have the wireless TDRs and the network smart markers that can do it as well. We've got seismics. There's nothing at all that's telling us 
anything about what's going on in here as we mine. And that's what the Cape Tracker system does. So let's just briefly look at some of the components of the Cape Tracker system. Here's the system, archite uh, system architecture diagram. Uh, we've talked about beacons that are embedded in the mine. We've got detectors that can be placed down long holes that measure the range to beacons. The detectors can also be put in drives, wherever you can put them really, uh, and their job is to measure the range to the beacons. But of course, you've got to get the data out of the detectors, so this is a complete system. The information from the detectors comes up and is automatically databased in a server, uh, generally on the surface. And to help facilitate that, we use these communication adapter modules, which connect up to the mine land backbone, either by Wi-Fi or fiber, or just normal land. And uh, these communication adapter modules provide power to the detectors and also communication power to the detectors. Uh, we can also plug what we call calibration beacons into these IT cams. Calibration beacons are just normal beacons, but they put at points where we know exactly where they are. And so we can test the system that are working accurately day by day and also perform the calibrations with the system. Here's a, um, here's a scale. This looks a bit like an alien here. That's the best picture I could give a person. <laughs> so this alien here is standing next to a beacon. And uh, so you get the relative size of the beacon here. Here's some of the electronics inside the beacon. Once the data comes up into the server, it can be accessed via clients. And here's a screenshot of uh, of a network connectivity client running at Argyle. So just instantly you can see what part of the system is online in terms of these detectors and IT cams and what parts are offline. Uh, there's a couple of offline devices here and sometimes they go offline because people work in those areas, they take the power down to those areas. In this case here, this guy here has just been installed so it doesn't come online yet. So it's quite easy to see what parts of the system are up mm -hmm. and down just at a glance. The beacons come in two sizes, uh, a 76 millimeter diameter beacon and a 135 millimeter diameter beacon. We can detect, we can detect the 135 millimeter beacons approximately 200 meters away from the detectors. And by stacking detectors uh, throughout the mine, you can follow the paths of beacons for more than 200 meters. The smaller 76 millimeter beacons, 76 millimeter diameter beacons, we can detect approximately 150 meters away. Now, what is the motivation for measuring ore flow? You could probably fill several pages of things that you would be interested in, why you want to measure ore flow. You know, what is the cave back profile as you start to initiate your cave? Do you have an air gap forming? How is it impacting on safety? What is the fundamental flow data? Does it follow these ellipsoid curves where certain rates equate to certain widths of draw? Or is it more chaotic? Is it dendritic? What's going on? Is there rat holing going on? What is the interaction? So it goes on and on and on. Now, there are many factors that we're interested in during the design phase and during the production phase of the mine. So we're interested in many of these factors. But there's very little we can do about them the, the only time you can really address these factors is when you design the mine with the draw point spacing, the level heights, and preconditioning, you know, particularly in block cap. And during the production phase, maybe you can change your blasting, especially in SLC, but um, the way that you blast the undercut, you can change your draw strategy, draw rates, shut off, and try and employ process controls. So there's very little effects you can actually have on all the things that you're interested in. And a lot of these things that we're interested in are currently invisible in this fragmented zone. So that's our motivation for measuring the ore flow. Now, just to give an example of some of the complexity that we may see, uh, we saw a really good example earlier. So this is just an illustrative example. But you might reasonably expect that if you had an isolated drawer coming down here, and you could place something like a beacon inside a cave, it would be reasonably reasonable to expect that it might just generally move downwards and report to the draw point as the cave propagated upwards. And this is just going to go on through more time just to, just to annoy me. <laughs> now in the next uh, section, 
you may have an effect going on like this, where you're drawing from down here as before. And we've heard about rilling today, perhaps there's a rilling action going on. And so if you could place a beacon or some sort of mark device in the ore flow, you might observe it moving along this rilling path. And straight away, all sorts of things can be going on if you have this sort of action. Perhaps the cave's not propagating up here. Perhaps it's propagating up here now because that's where the material's been drawn from. You almost certainly don't have isolated draw. So if you're also drawing from over here, this may be propagating up at a much higher rate than you expect because the material is reporting from somewhere different than you expect. But as I said, you, it's not really known what is going on in this zone. So again, why is it useful? Being able to monitor all flow throughout the mine in 3D, pretty much on a day-by-day -day basis, helps us answer a lot of these questions we have about what is going on in the mine. And more importantly, being able to see inside the mine during the mining process allows us to close the loop. So if you have real-time monitoring, you can observe hang-ups forming 80, 90, 100 more meters above where you're drawing and do something about it. If you put a network of beacons in and you see them steadily move down and they all start pausing at a certain point, that's going to give you some insight uh, that there's some activity going on there and perhaps give you the chance to change your draw strategy if that's what you want to do. So for the first time actually employ process control on processes that aren't now have been invisible. Oops. And of course, better knowledge of these factors ultimately leads to improved recovery. So that's closing the loop. And that's kind of reflected in our little logo here. You can see it's uh, going around in a circle here. So that's why we, I love this little logo. It's like a little marker and closing the loop at the same time. So let's get on to some results. We first uh, deployed the, the initial revisions of the CAD Tracker system in 2014. And we're going to see a video of the very first beacon that was deployed uh, reporting to a draw point over the period of about a year uh, in a gold mine in a block cave. You might recognize this cave. These purple items here are detectors that are installed down long poles. And this yellow point here is the beacon. And you just saw the range vectors being drawn in. So this is actual data. This isn't hand animated. I'll just take the um, data from over a year and time lapsed it and we can monitor the beacon report to, to the draw point below. And here's, here's its path. It actually stalled in this position here for about eight months, um, roughly, just above the draw valves. And then it, uh, it released and came down another uh, 10 or so meters, and then held on for another month or so, and then reported very quickly. And There was a little bit of uh, wobbling that you could see, some jitter in the measurements. And the data from these particular detectors was very clean at this mine. But because they're buried pretty much inside the mine, the electromagnetic conditions for the detectors at those locations is excellent. There's very, very little noise. And for some of the detectors that were like 60 meters away, we could see centimeters change in range. If you're 170 meters away, uh, 120 meters away, then you might see about a five meter jitter on the results. Uh, but it's also important where you put the detectors, and if we had an extra detector in the uh, extraction drive, then the jitter that you see on the way down would have pretty much been eliminated just because of the geometry of the detectors and the mathematics used to calculate the beacon position. Here's uh, the beacon was actually recovered, and here's a picture of it here. Uh, still recognizably a beacon. I know it certainly went through one crusher and perhaps two crushes, so, uh, <laughs> so it's still good, doing pretty well. Uh, and so there's a few chunks taken out of it, but yeah, we followed that beacon all the way down. So we were uh, very happy with that. Again, that was, that was the world's first to actually track something down to the all point through the fragmented zone. So our next installation uh, of it. Rio Tinto's Argyle mine up here in uh, northwest Australia uh, was a much larger scale affair. 
where we've got about 23 beacons, the 76 uh, millimeter diameter beacon, in these two holes, uh, affectionately called hole one and hole two. I think they have much more complicated names in the CAD system, so we just call them hole one and hole two. Space roughly 10 meters apart, and you can see the rough distances above the extraction level. The extraction level uh, also contained the detectors, and so the detectors were buried between or in holes between 6 to 15 metres below the extraction level, uh, which is a very challenging environment for detectors because, as you can imagine, it's electromagnetically a very noisy area. Now, slide that. We're going to see a video of the um, propagation or of the movement of these beacons over a year. So there's a few things to look at in this video. Uh, one is the date, so here is 2015 March, so they were installed in December and, uh, and their March position was like their date and position in the holes, so you can see where the beacons are in their holes. Uh, the detectors are down here, we have a plan view looking straight down. We have this panel here shows a view to the south, which is looking into these holes. We've got a view to the east, which is looking at the crosswinds. And so when I play the video, you'll see the date increase month by month by month. It goes from, uh, from May 2015 up to May 2016. Okay, so we're off. You can score. Oh, gosh, I had the wrong button. I was warned not to hit the laser printer button, uh, the laser pointer. Maybe I can just go back to slide. Would that be possible? Okay, let's try that again. Here we go. Okay, so here's the date changing up here. And we can see the beacons making their way down to the draw points. This is going to loop, and you see a, a couple of speedy ones are taking off. Uh, actually, only about four or five weeks ago, uh, those guys started to move down. This is still hasn't, hasn't reported. <coughs> can I just uh, play that one again? That would be great. So, it may look like a bunch of dots, but this is really quite a historical moment, being able to actually measure what is going on in the mine as we draw. And it's not only moving beacons that we're interested in, often we're more interested in beacons that aren't moving at all. If you have beacons that remain stationary, and you're pulling tons and tons and tons under that area, then that is uh, an indicator that perhaps something is not happening like you want. Um, perhaps you have an ear gap forming. And you can imagine by uh, utilizing different installation geometries or layers, then you can get a very interesting picture of what is going on <coughs> in your mind. Uh, perhaps you're interested in uh, boundary uh, dilution entry. Are you moving into your boundaries so you can put beacons along those boundaries? And you actually don't want to see them move. You want to see them, you want to see them stay in the same place. If you see them move, you know you're in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> so, this, this slide's been here, in here a few times, but why is it useful? Being able to measure this flow in real time. In, in this case, uh, we had measurements taken every three days from those beacons. Uh, in the earlier case, we were making measurements twice a day. Oops. By measuring those, that flow, you can help answer all these questions. Employ real-time monitoring in case you see issues occur way above the extraction level. Employ process control and improve recovery. So how did the system perform? We were pretty pleased with the results. I know I'm biased, but I was very pleased to see that as uh, beacons moved down. Uh, the triangulated positions ended up in the correct mine, in the correct quarter, under the correct hole, so that, that was something and then to see the pattern start to move. Uh, we had to improve our signal conditioning uh, for the detectors, but we could do all that remotely from our offices because we could connect in via the internet uh, to get better signal-to-noise ratios. And with those improvements, uh, we, we got those results that you just saw. Uh, we had a couple of beacons that uh, didn't spin upon installation. This was the first revision of the beacon, and uh, we found a software issue that we've addressed now. They just didn't, they just didn't start. And we also uh, found a clearance issue between one of the bearings and one of the springs, so it's sort of like teething issues. But for the beacons that uh, spun 
they have performed pretty well. Uh, it's more than just beacons though, it's a whole system. And so the detectors are, are run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they've been operating for over a year, pretty much in that regime. Uh, there's been the old power cut in the area, as you can imagine. Uh, but the system is designed to handle that sort of thing, and if power is restored and communication is restored, the system just starts operating automatically. We designed it specifically for that, so you don't have to call IT people to come and you know, sort out IP addresses and get all the equipment running again. And so the system has successfully operated. We've been operating it for over a year uh, from our offices in Brisbane by uh, logging into the mine. So in conclusion, it's now possible for the first time to carry out measurements inside an operational cave, inside and outside the fragmented zone on a daily basis. This in situ rock movement data can be used to improve the process control. And also, this data, it's fundamental, you can use it to improve your mine designs by a bit of knowledge of flow, you can improve, improve draw bail designs, and you can actually make changes um, while you're in the mining process as well. Okay, thank you. That's a great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if you have an idea of the uh, accuracy within which you know the location of your markers. I knew that question was going to come up. <laughs> yes, it's, we aim for a 5% range in accuracy, and if you uh, embed the detectors like in the ore body, like away from everything, uh, you can quite easily achieve, uh, achieve a 5% range in accuracy. So that means as you get out to 100 meters, you can expect to see um, you know, five or so meter jitter. Sometimes we see better than that, and sometimes due to noise, particularly because you know, we have these detectors only several meters under the extraction level, it can be quite a bit worse. And uh, it can be frequency dependent as well, so we know to carry out frequency surveys before we begin. Uh, and the ranging accuracy is just one part of it, because you have detectors distributed geometrically. You know, we use a least squared algorithm to get the position result, and um, you know the non-linearities of, of those algorithms can handle their own jitter as well. Um, one thing I should say is, it's not always the exact position that you're interested in. Like, of course, it's fantastic if you know it, but let's say something is eight meters off to the side, but you notice everything's stopping. That's just as important to know. Yeah. You know, you don't really care if it's five minutes this way or five minutes this way. It's like, wow, this, this, this process is stopping and now it's starting again. And in the uh, early days of this, before we got all the positioning kicked in and stuff, you know, we were looking at the range for us. Has the cave, has the cave propagated past this area? Mm, yes, the range is starting to come down. So, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, time for one more question. No, oh, that's great. Um, we always want to have an X-ray region to the cave. Um, one question I had is you show the recovered marker. Uh, at any stage, do you think about recovering the, the piece of rock that came with, or whether, like, whether it came out solo, or was it like one cubic meter piece of rock? Because that might tell you something more about the history. Yeah, those ones that have come down, and, and we have this opportunity going on, uh, Glenn might be in the audience here, we can work with the guys on site to say, here yeah, we think it's coming down at this point. Is it possible to, see, can you see it on the real part? Do we get lucky? Uh, can we pick it up from the tram bin and uh, equate the time that it was picked up you know, with the LHD operation, et cetera, et cetera, in trying to look at that lithography that it came out in? Uh, we have considered early on actually embedding smart markers inside them, just putting the extra circuit board but we just decided to avoid the initial complexity on our first deployments. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, with the new technology, it gives you the opportunity to carry out so many interesting tests. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of those sort of tests. All right, thank you, Dylan.